Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for watching online. So we are about to wrap up topology. So almost the last lecture. And well, I would like to answer one main question today, which you will see in a second, and uh, which I will recall in a second, namely whether, well, we already know that the trefoil is not uh, trivial, but the figure eight not, we still actually can't tell whether it's trivial or not. And well, let me just run the video again with the colorings to remind you and to also motivate what we are doing today, because we're kind of generalizing this picture on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is very impressive actually, also get an algorithmic way to decide whether or not uh, admits a coloring or not. So a coloring was this idea, uh, the video will run in a second, that we color you know, the crossings of a projection with three colors, such that around each crossing you see either all different colors or um, you have the monochromatic ones. The monochromatic ones are not very exciting, but they work as well and we will see in the generalization um, why we actually need them to kind of make sense of everything algebraically. But what is not allowed are the kind of colorings with two colors and the third color, so the middle ones. And what we argued here um, for the trefoil was that the trefoil admits three colorings and except the three trivial ones, there are six others just by given by, by the symmetry on the trefoil by exchanging the colors, which shows um, that the trefoil is not trivial because, well, this was, was a not invariant in the end. Okay, great. I mean, this was a really, really lovely argument. Um, the unmod not always only has the trivial colors. But it kind of failed for this not here. Um, and if we try it, you can actually see why it fails. So you start somewhere and just continue and then, then you essentially just have one more choice and then you are stuck. But let me just pause here so you can't fill in any remaining color because the, the marked crossing tells you the color should be blue, but then you violate the condition uh, on the bottom. And yeah, so that's just what it is. You just can't do it. But if you want to think of white, which is still white here, as a forced color, then it looks like this admits a four coloring in some sense. Um, and we are going to make that precise, right? If, if the white one is another color, then look at the crossings. It looks pretty good to me, actually. Uh, so maybe just the problem is that three coloring is a bit too restrictive and we should look for higher colorings, whatever higher colorings are. So uh, that's what we will do today. So the question is still, we haven't answered it yet, is that yet, which is a bit disappointing, of course, but um, is our little figure eight not actually the unbot? Let me go back to the table. So I showed you the table. So it definitely is not the unknot. It's the only knot with four crossings. Um, the unknot clearly has zero crossings. But we, strictly speaking, haven't showed that yet. I just told you that it's true. Okay. Um, so we need some other knot invariant to show that the figure eight knot is not the unknot. The only one we had so far uh, kind of was the coloring and the crossing number. But the crossing number is essentially uncomputable. And the, col the three coloring failed. So we wrote another knot invariant. And I will show you the second knot invariant of this lecture, the second useful one, um, the p color. So the first one was the three coloring, and now we do the p color. And uh, I already started this with this last time, and I will just do it again to just make clear here what is going on. So in, instead of looking at three colorings, I would like to color my segments, maybe my colors were before uh, something like red, blue, and say green. Uh, instead of thinking about colors, I think of numbers. And uh, the three here is just that I go up to three minus one with colors starting at zero, counting at zero. So zero, one, two. These are exactly the reminders of by division by three. So you can only have zero, one, two if you divide by three. And this is kind of where we uh, get the generalization from. So we either had the monochromatic coloring or uh, the three coloring. And if we just fill in numbers in my fashion from here, let's say zero was, was uh, red, one was uh, blue, and two is green. So here's a two, a one, and a zero. And if you just add up all the numbers around, you get three, which clearly is divisible by three. So uh, three is divisible by three. And if you just add 
anything here, whatever, Kala 1, for example, the monochromatic coloring, I mean, you get three times whatever kind of color you have. So whatever it is, it will definitely also be divisible by three. So maybe our generalization is, and it, it exactly is, that we just think of a coloring as a choice of numbers around a crossing such that the sum of all is divisible by three. And we just use the colors for visual aid, but actually it's really just a numbering of the strings. And that, that works perfectly well. So if you do everything here, so I already did this one, it was a one, two, zero, and it comes out to three, and here, whatever, two, 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 it always comes out to three times, in the same way it comes out to six. Both of them are divisible by three, so that's good. But if you would do this one here, for example, uh, this would be a zero, a one, and a one, uh, so it comes out as two, which is not, oops, well, this was a bad knot, uh, which is not divisible by three. And same here, well, let me just, let me just fill it in. So this is one, one, zero, uh, which is again two, and here it's also one, one, zero, which is again two, and all of them kind of fail the test of being divisible by three. So that's essentially the correct condition um, to have around the crossing. And all colors should sum up to a multiple of three. And if you know that, then actually you can generalize it as follows. So instead of writing C1 plus C2 plus C3 is a multiple of three, which in um, math language is something like it's congruent, well, three is of course also correct, zero mod three is just saying it's a multiple of three. I will write, I will put one of them on the other side and I get the following equation. So I call, it's exactly the same idea. I call a not P colorable for some P, but very large generalization of three colorable, um, four, five, six, whatever, a P colorable, and not if we can color the segments with elements from zero up to P minus one, such that two times the overcrossing, two times the one that crosses over is congruent to, uh, sorry, two times the one that cross, crosses over is congruent to uh, the sum of the undercrossing ones, modulo my prime. And that's exactly what we did before, um, because this is just, this just means that the sum, that the, the, uh, the difference is divisible by P. So it just says two t times CI minus CJ minus CK is divisible by my number P. And when P is three, I just try to convince you um, that this is exactly what we had before. And otherwise, it really looks the same, so we just copy everything. We get the number of colorings, CP, of P colorings, and we call the not P colorable if it has a P coloring that uses at least two colors. Again, kind of the same idea. So um, we have the monochromatic colorings, which always makes sense here, right? So if you color any, anything here with whatever, three, 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 let's say P is five, I can color everything with three. And of course, this equation is satisfied because two times three is certainly congruent to three plus three. So the monochromatic colorings are always colorings and then you have other ones. So for example, you could have, um, so if this would be three here, let me try another one. You could have, well, let's say this is three, um, then let's say this would be one, and we would need to satisfy uh, six, should be congruent one plus x uh, mod, mod, mod p, so we could use mod five. So we could use, for example, zero as a, as a final color. So six uh, leaves remainder one up to one division by five. So the equation six congruent one plus zero is, is true. And we can then, well, let me do it in black. We can then just write down a lot of those conditions depending on P and we get the, the coloring. And it, it, what really matters is if the, is a, if the not projection is in a way that the, the, we can assign that uh, throughout the projection without any well, without any problems. And we call that P color. It has the same notation as before. And again, this depends on the not projection, but there is a very similar proof as before. Just check the randomized moves. Uh, so this is actually uh, not invariant. I will make a formal statement in a second. And note again, it's kind of very, very important that for P coloring, we have always at, le at least P colors namely the trivial ones, 
so the color range was 0, 1 to up to p minus 1. And the interesting cases are those where this equality is strict, right? So note the difference here, strict versus uh, not strict. And these are the p color epsilons. Exactly the same, just we replaced 3 by p, which is pretty good because now we have an infinite number of potential uh, invariants we can throw at knots. Um, it's pretty, I mean, and, and everything goes through in the same way, right? So um, the theorem is both of them, the number itself and the, pro, the ability to be p colorable, they're both invariant. Yeah. So if you have a knot, um, you can check actually for any prime whether it satisfies that property, and you get a huge list of uh, yes or no answers and a huge list of, well, an infinite list of yes or no answers and an infinite list of uh, numberings, I mean, varying p. And that's pretty good. So we've now, an inf from, from having just one invariant, we now have an infinite number of invariants. Uh, that's, probably, that's pretty good. But it leaves open the question, actually, how we actually ever be able to compute those. And that's what I will answer. And the answer is pretty, pretty amazing. So there's an algorithm to do that, and I will explain that. So at the end of the lecture, so at the beginning of the lecture, we started with just one invariant that we had, which wasn't good enough to detect, for example, the figure eight knot. And at the end of the lecture, we have infinitely many invariants that we can also compute all algorithmically, while at this point, we don't even know how to compute three colorings using an algorithm. It's a pretty good statement. Um, and there will be also another statement, and I will highlight that later. But for now, that's the goal. Uh, just we had one coloring, uh, sorry, one coloring, we had three colorings, so one invariant that we don't really know how to compute. So I mean, for a general knot, that might be really, really hard. And at the end of the lecture, we have infinitely many invariants, and all of them are computable using an algorithm, which is a huge improvement of the state of the arts. It's just uh, really ridiculous, and so it's really good. And spoiler, spoiler, of course, this will be able to detect uh, the figure eight knot. Otherwise, my, my question in the beginning would have been a bit boring. Without bothering with too many of the details, if you look at those proofs of those facts that we had for the, for the three coloring, um, and so for the three coloring, they go through word by word. For P coloring, just replace every appearance of three um, by P. For example, we have this little inequality, uh, equality here from the hash um, to uh, the, the product and one, one over P, which again kind of shows that there are infinitely many uh, knots if you just find one of them that is whatever, five colorable or something. Okay, and as you can already tell from those pictures, um, it looks like they actually, before it was white, now it's something like purple, um, but it, it looks like they're actually four or five color level or something, um, and that actually really works. So those two knots are not three color level, but they are color level for higher color. So in the end, we have a really good tool um, to distinguish or to de determine whether or not it's trivial or kind of families of knots that are equivalent or non-equivalent, because we have an infinite number of invariants that we can use uh, for those knots. But right now, we can't really tell, and it's more like a guessing game. So what I would like to answer is we really need a, 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 a any way. I'm just writing a better way, but we have, don't have anything. So we need some way to determine whether or not it's pre-colorable. And it turns out it has a really amazing answer. And it turns out that um, essentially it's about solving a matrix equation. Um, you can do that algorithmically, solving a linear system. Which is absolutely not clear from the outset, so I don't see any linear system around here right now. But there is a linear system in the background that you just associate to every projection, and you just solve it. Right? So you just solve uh, a system of linear equations, which is always possible. Right? So linear equations are kind of the easiest types of equations you can, uh, you can you ever meet in your life. And linear algebra may be one of the most powerful tools around. So we, uh, you use very, very simple linear algebra, and it turns out that it is essentially equivalent to this problem, which is very remarkable as a result. So we, I said again, because it's kind of very crucial and <laughs> extremely nice. So from one knot invariant, which we don't know how to compute, we go to infinitely many knot invariants, 
which we can compute by an algorithm. So you can, for example, ask a computer how to do it and just do it for you. And for small nodes, it's actually so simple that you can do it by hand. Obviously, if you have a 5 million and 12 crossing nodes, you don't want to do that by hand anymore. But a computer can do it. Maybe not 5 million and 12, I'm not too sure. But that certainly a few hundred crossings is not a problem uh, for a machine. And, and a few crossings is not a problem for you, so for a human. That's pretty cool. That's very an amazing answer um, to a question which doesn't seem to be tractable in any sense at all. But it's pretty good. So let me explain how that works. Let's start with an example. Or well, let, let me repeat what we have seen. Um, so what we want to do is exactly this one here, just for the figure eight knot, or for other knots as well, depending um, whether they are, whatever they are. For example, here, this one. Now, again, looks like it, it uses three colors, uh, the figure eight knot. And you can also tell knots apart, because for example, the figure eight knot is not three colorable, so it can't be a track oil. And we want, uh, th so this statement is centered around the track oil. Uh, we had that, and then let me stress it again. So it's really saying that the trefoil is not, but it doesn't really make any statement about the other knots. And we kind of want to have a bigger machine so that we can uh, include guys like this one here as well. Um, kind of for every knot, there will be some type of color uh, that you can use. And we want the same for the figure eight knot and other knots. Like this one here, which I actually forgot which one it is. Uh, so let's check, it has five crossings, but it's probably one of the two five knots, five one or five two. Um, there are only two knots with five crossings, so it's one of them. Okay, and I'll show you how this works. And we just do the running example here of the figure eight knot. And I claim if you understand the figure eight knot, you kind of get the general picture anyway. I will explain the general picture of course as well. But let's just start with the figure eight knot. If you want to figure out whether it admits a higher coloring. Um, and we want to do it in a smart way, not by testing all possibilities until we run out of, run out of uh, well, colors. No, we want to do it in some, some smart algorithmic way. And what we do is we just label the segments, or C1. There will be always be, so I have four segments. There will always be as many segments as we see crossing. So um, at least for the alternating knots, so C1, C2, C3 and C4, and we want to assign numbers to them. That was a very ugly four, so we want to assign numbers to them. We want to find some numbers, C1, C2, C2 and C4, um, that do the following. So around each crossing, we want this condition, because that's exactly uh, what we had here. So around each crossing, uh, where is it, one further, we want this condition. And I just put the J and the K on the other side. So it's 2 CI minus CJ minus CK is 0 module. It's divisible by P. 0 mod P. Okay, and we just write that in the matrix. It's a very, very exciting idea. We just write them in the matrix. First crossing, second crossing, third crossing, fourth crossing. Uh, just a condition on the crossings. Um, and each crossing will meet three of them. So each crossing gets uh, one of those. Equation. So um, the over strand is always the one that um, goes over, so we can do it explicitly. Let me try. So see, let's say this is the first crossing. Um, let me do, use a different color. Let's say this is the first crossing, second crossing, third crossing, fourth crossing. You can label them in any way you want, and you just get a permuted matrix. So let's just label it like this. Then the over strand here gets a 2, so this is strand C1. And the two under strands, um, so that's a C, well, C3, for example, and this is C4. And let's see whether this actually works. Let me get rid of those because it doesn't. <laughs> the wrong labeling. Um, okay. So, okay, that would be crossing one. And now C3 is the overcrossing here, so this is crossing three. C4 is the overcrossing here, so this is crossing four. C1 is here and these uh, C, well, the, the last one, C2 is here, so this is the second one. And let's have a look at the second one. So two, go, two goes over, C2 goes over, uh, one goes under and four goes under. So two goes over, one goes under, four goes under. And you do it in the same way. 
Let me do one more for you. Um, let's do this one here. The third crossing is here. So green is the, is the third entry. I will have another explicit example in a second. Green goes over, and the other two go under, and you just mark them in the matrix. And the equation that we want to solve becomes a linear equation in that matrix, namely uh, the matrix times the vector we want to find is zero. And we just want to find that vector, and that's a linear equation. So from a projection, by just numbering the crossings and the segments, we got uh, a linear equation that we need to solve, which is equivalent to the coloring problem. Okay, so we have a linear equation now. So we have a coloring, and a coloring is determined by four colors, so a vector, if and only if my matrix here annihilates my vector, essentially by the definition of the matrix. And the matrix, by the way, is called the not matrix. We will see that uh, in a second again. And that's pretty cool. I mean, a coloring problem that you don't really know how to solve in general. Kind of right now, we, the only approach we had is kind of try, so <laughs> brute force, try and error. Uh, but this is just, just a question that you just write out a matrix and you solve a matrix equation. And this is really just saying that I have four linear equations that I need to solve. And namely the four ones that are written up here. And I can solve linear equations by with a kind of Gauss elimination or something. So that's, that's really good, right? So we turn the problem, at least here for the figure eight class, of finding coloring into a subject in the, from the realm of linear algebra, the problem of solving certain types of linear equations. And that's pretty good. And the matrices we see are really not hard. It just contains twos and minus one. It's pretty good. Um, so it's really just linear algebra, and we turned the problem in not theory into linear algebra, which is extremely remarkable. So they don't seem to be related at all from the outset, but they are. It's kind of the same type of problem. Um, and this kind of also explains why, um, if you just look at the matrix and at the vector, so the trivial coloring, where everything is just the same, will always be a solution here. And that's why we take it as a, as a trivial coloring. The monochromatic coloring will always be a solution. We just look at the rows uh, at the columns of the matrix. If all numbers are the same, they, they clearly come out as 0, 2 minus 1 minus 1. So we always get them as solutions here uh, using this approach. And that's why we have them as solutions in general, because then we can just write down this nice if and only if here. So it's really about solving um, a linear system. And the interesting ones are the non-trivial solutions to the matrix equation. Okay. And let me now explain how that works in general. It's exactly what we did, but let me just do it for you. So the not matrix, so we take a projection with n crossings, and we do this, the following. I'll just do the example for you. So we, we just label all the segments. So this could be a projection down here, for example. We just label all the segments. Um, which is the same, uh, well, and we labeling the segments, I should give it the correct color, so this is uh, green, and this is blue, so I label the segments, and this indexes the columns of my matrix, and I uh, number the crossings, which indexes the rows of my matrix, so I have a green crossing here, green, that's my first row, I have a blue crossing, uh, blue, that's my second row, and I have this, it was supposed to be orange, it came out as something like yellow, uh, so the orange type crossing down here, which is the, uh, the last one. Okay, so we, and then we get a square matrix in N, N is the number of crossings, the N by N matrix, whose entries are determined as follows. So at each crossing, you look at what crosses over, and you give it a two, uh, you give it a two. So here, the red strand gets a two, and everything that crosses under gets a minus one. So here, the red strand crosses under, so it also gets a minus one, and the blue strand crosses under, so it also gets a minus one. So the, uh, the one that travels through, whether it's over or under, it doesn't make a difference, but the one that travels through gets um, the, the two, and the one that is broken, the ones that are broken, get a minus one and you just fill it in in the corresponding column. So here's C1 column, it gets a two and a minus one, 
the C2 column, it gets a minus one. And this is not related to the crossing at all, so it gets a zero. And just do that for all crossings. I will do another one for you. It's really, really simple. Um, you just do it once yourself, and it's not so hard. Let's do orange. So for orange, what do we see? Let me just copy the orange crossing. The orange crossing looks like something like this. So we fill in a minus one for red, a two for red, and a minus one for green. And that's exactly what we did. And everything else um, gets a zero. And you just do that row by row. It's really simple. So every row gets three numbers. Uh, uh, gets three numbers associated. So a two, a minus one, and a minus one. They might end up as the same here. So two minus one here for C1, for example. But you always just associate. We have three strings, so you always associate three numbers. And let's call it the not matrix. So from a, from not projection, you get this uh, matrix. It's really not hard. You just you just do it locally by just looking at the crossing and your choice of uh, labeling of the strands. So really it's just plus twos or minus ones all the way around uh, the matrix. All right, before I can make a statement, so it, essentially the, the result will be solve the linear system in that matrix and that will be your, your coloring. Um, but that's not quite true. We need to restrict to a certain type of knots which are all the knots we will really ever see, um, and we call them alternating. Okay, so alternating knot. Uh, alternating knots are just much easier than general knots. And a knot projection is called alternating. Very simple idea. If, if you start somewhere, and it doesn't matter where you start, and you walk around, around the knot, you always go under, over, under, over, under, over. So you alternate in going under or over. So you go under, then we put an under here. You travel around. You go over, over, travel around, you go under, travel around, you go over, and so on and so on. Just traveling around, you always alternate between going over and under. Um, by convention, this one is an alternating knot as well, because if you travel around, you always alternate between nothing, so you alternate between going over and under. Um, so this is alternating, this is alternating. Let's see this one here. If you stare at it for a second, you will see you travel around, you go under, over, under, over, under, over. So this is alternating as well. Uh, here the same, you go under, uh, sorry, over, under, over, under, and so on. Alternating. This is not alternating uh, because, let's do it again, you go over and then over again. So this is not alternating. And here, let me see, uh, it's not alternating. We have this little pair here. Uh, so you go over and over in a row. So from a knot projection, you can easily read off whether it's alternating or not. And alternating knots are just much, much easier. Um, so for example, for alternating knots, the crossing number is extremely easy to compute. It's just the only what you see. But for non-alternating knots, it's much trickier. Uh, keep in mind that, so let, let me just give you the formal definition and just say it in words. A knot is alternating if it has one alternating projection. And the projection is alternating if whatever you see is alternating. So this depends on the projection. So I could ask, for example, is the not alternating? Uh, then it might be hard to tell, because you might end up with a non-alternating picture of a knot. But if I just ask, is, is the diagram alternating, the not projection, you just read it off. You just travel along and look for those beasts here, and can just read it off, whether it's alternating or not. Here's what I've written up. A projection is alternating if crossings alternate between over and under. Like if you just cross, uh, uh, walk around the, the projection. And so this is not a knot invariant. It depends on the projection. And you would, you would call it not alternating if it has an alternating projection. So it's really not a knot invariant. I give you an example now, which I recommend to look at carefully, namely uh, the trefoil, sorry, that's not the trefoil, the unknot, which in this sense is clearly alternating, there is no crossing, so the condition is clearly satisfied. No crossings means it is satisfied. But you can find very complicated, um, clearly non-alternating, here you can see it again, clearly non-alternating projections of those knots. So here you go under and under if you walk along in this direction. 
So it's not alpha letting, but it's the input value. And it might not be really trivial to go from one to the other. I just uh, did the sequence for you of randomized the moves. Um, so similarly for other knots. So to tell whether a knot is alternating is usually not so easy unless it already comes in an alternating form. And if it comes in an alternating form and it's really good, then you thumbs up and you just run all the machinery. So alternating, you're, you're always good. So alternating is, is uh, much easier than the general picture. Okay, if you stare at this picture here, for example, I don't know how you feel. Um, the first one looks very complicated to be without the sequence. Of course, I can check here every step that this untwists into the unknot, um, but it looks very complicated to me, and that's exactly why we want uh, not invariant. From a certain point onward, it's kind of clear, maybe roughly around here, that it will undo itself by, by, by staring, but at least uh, from the first one, it's, it's, it's really not clear at all. So uh, I, it's highly recommended to, to at least stare at those pictures for a while and convince yourself that I haven't messed up here my, my steps of undoing uh, the knot. Anyway, for an alternating knot, we can say quite a lot. So mostly I will ask about alternating knots eventually anyway, and then you can use all the uh, invariant freely uh, for non-alternating knots, things get a little bit trickier. So always check first. It's really easy to check. Just walk around and see whether it goes under and over in an alternating way. Um, so for an alternating knot which was, that was written on the, on the last slide, that was probably way too quick, actually what happens is that um, the rows and columns are always really sum up to zero, and that's really, really useful. So, so uh, the row and column sum will always be zero. And I have some examples here of some knot matrices. Um, you can see it's way more kind of uh, evenly spread than uh, in the general. And so we can say more about those maybe. So for the track wall, for example, it's just this three by three matrix with twos on the diagonal and minus ones on the off diagonal. And I will come back to this slide later. I would like to remember this little box here. And I will do a little trick for you now. And we'll see later why I would like to do this trick. So I just consider, I just cut out one row and one column. I just have this two by two matrix. Um, and let's actually see what the determinant of this matrix is. So this little matrix down here has determinant. Well, let's see, two times two and then minus, minus one times minus one, which is uh, four minus one, which is three, which is very interesting because it corresponds to our three cards. And the main result will be that a knot is p-colorable if and only if the determinant, and I just computed here, uh, is divisible by p. So it will show, this example already then will show, that the trefoil is three colorable but it's, for example, not five color because the determinant is divisible by three, which is, again, non-trivial because in principle, you just need to play around uh, with the colorings, but you just compute the knot matrix and it's determinant and it will come out for three, which is a kind of a really cool statement. And this was a spoiler. We haven't seen that yet, but it will come up in about well, five minutes or so. Kind of the main statement is that you, you just compute this matrix that you do by an algorithm really simple, you just walk around the knot and collect the numbers, compute its determinant and that, that is equivalent to um, uh, answering the question whether it's p colorable or not. And so I, I just skipped this lemma, so it's very interesting. I give the proof here. And what I would like to do is that the knot matrix, um, which was my mk, and I just do the following. So the notation here is as follows. I have my knot matrix, mk, which is some matrix, and I cross out the first row and the first column, and whatever remains, exactly what I did for the, for the trefoil, I take the determinant of this one. And whatever that is, I call it the knot determinant. The so knot determinant is you take out one row, the first row and the first column of the knot matrix, and you compute the determinant of what's left. And the reason why you do that um, 
is in the proof that I'm going to that I just skipped. But essentially, what happens is since the knot closes up, um, the whole matrix that we want to compute it for the threefold actually is singular, so it has determinant zero. So um, one of the crossing is dependent of the others. And we actually have seen that if you try to color those knots, as soon as you have determined two colorings, the last one, or n, n minus one coloring, the last one is determined by the rest. And then the matrix just means it has one too many rows or columns. The matrix is that the movies are linear dependent, and you just cut it off. So you just cut off the linear dependence. And you just consider a matrix which is one smaller. So the knot determinant is a determinant of n minus one cross n minus one matrix, because I just crossed out uh, the, the first row and the first column. You just compute this number, it's some number, right? It's some number. And we actually only care about uh, its absolute value. That's it. It's just some number. I skip, um, again, if you want to look at the calculations, I did all of them, but um, let me just say it again. The very, very important definition, the not determinant is the determinant of the slightly, I draw the picture again because it's important, of the slightly uh, castrated uh, not matrix. So you just get rid of first column and row, so this is gone, 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 and you compute the determinant of this beast here. And that's not determined. Um, in principle, you could take any, you could cut out any uh, row or column that you like, and you just do uh, the first one for convenience. So you always get the same not determined. If you would decide to cut out the last row and column, you would get the same determined. But that's just a remark. Okay. And the theorem, it works from two onwards following. So for an alternating knot, this is an if and only if criterion. Yeah? So it's really, really strong theorem. And it, 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 it's completely algorithmic. You just need to compute a determinant of some matrix, which is not so hard. The if and only if, uh, the p, it's p colorable if and only if p divides that number. For example, um, for determinant of the trefoil, let me see whether I can actually draw trefoil, something like this. Um, that's clearly alternating, so we can use the theorem. What I, what I got was something like three, which tells you, without any extra work, you have now done infinitely many cases of coloring, because obviously three is the only prime, uh, the only p that divides <laughs> the number three. Um, so one is, is not counted here, we go from three, uh, bigger than three onwards. So it's only three colorable. It's not five colorable. It's not 512 colorable. It's only three colorable. That's a very strong statement. So it's not, it's even better than just checking if it's colorable for one P. It checks whether it's colorable for all P at once. By a very simple, by reasonably simple calculation of just uh, one determinant. Okay, I, I skipped the proof. It's again just playing with linear algebra and just um, go to the remark section and then kind of answer the question of the trackball. So actually, what you can show is that it's really a knot invariant. Um, that's what we did in the proof, so that's what I skipped. So this, the, the, the determinant itself is actually a knot invariant, not just its divisibility. So the determinant itself is a knot invariant, which kind of collects all the divisibility statements in just one number, which is uh, a pr pretty cool actually, right? So you have infinitely many statements about infinitely many knot invariants, and they just appear collected in one number, which is this uh, knot determinant. Um, something you can try yourself is it behaves nicely with respect to the hash. It's just a product. So uh, k hash l is just determinant k times determinant l. So in particular, if determinant P is prime, then, well, either one uh, uh, needs to be uh, prime as well, right? So if, if, if this number here is prime, 
then one of them needs to be one and the other one needs to be a prime as well, a prime as well, clearly by this formula, right? If red is prime, the other one needs to be as well. So we can actually um, tell a little bit about those colorings, how they're related to, um, to uh, the determinant. Really good. Um, and you can make a better statement for normal mathematical nodes, which I'm not going too much into details here. Um, in particular, it's also not proven on the trivial slides. But it's not like, I only picked out alternating you got to get But there is a statement um, for non-alternating knots. And what you need to do is you need to take the knot matrix. And it's, then it depends which, which row or column you cut out. If you cut out some row or column, compute the determinant of the rest. And um, you need to check all of them. And if one of them is divisible by E, then it's, it's uh, divisible, and then it is, uh, what is it called, uh, p colorable. So it's really the same idea, just you need to check all uh, crossing out versions of the knot matrix, and not just one. So for the alternating knots, you just need to check one, and for non-alternating knots, you need to check all of them. Okay, let me just do that again. So algorithmically, how it works. Um, it's kind of recommended to do it yourself. It's really not hard. For something like figure eight knot, you get a four by four matrix. You cross out one column and one row, so you get a three by three matrix whose determinant you need to calculate. And I already told you the answer, remember. So this one actually is the answer for, ah, there's a, very, very, a, few, a lot of slides here. Uh, somewhere here, uh, one before. This one here actually um, is the answer. So we need to compute its uh, determinant. Blah, 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 okay, okay, okay. Where are we? Okay, almost. So you just label the segment of the trackball. Um, we'll have to, sorry, not of the trackball. We'll have to figure out in a second again. And labeling the trackball, uh, labeling the segments, labeling the crossings, and compute the entries of the knot matrix. It will be a four by four matrix. So this piece here will be four by four. Four crossings and four segments. It'll be a four by four matrix. And if you compute the determinant of the matrix, I'll say it again, you get the four by four matrix. You ignore first column and row. You have a three by three sub matrix and you compute its determinant. And that's it. So here's the, the matrix again, uh, slightly differently rearranged because I used some uh, different numbering, you get that matrix, you get take this submatrix here, compute its uh, determinant, and if I haven't messed up, then the determinant is five, which tells us that um, the figure eight knot is actually five colorable and only five colorable, which is absolutely not clear again, but it's quite a simple uh, calculation on, on the matrix. So it's just a determinant of a three by three matrix. We can do that. We can do that by hand. Uh, it's, it's a bit annoying calculation. Determinants are a bit annoying, but it's not so bad. In contrast to checking infinitely many uh, colorings by hand, it, it's, it's much preferable. So let me show you um, actually the. Okay, so this, by the way, shows that the figure eight knot is not, not trivial, right? So because it's a non trivially uh, five color. It turns out that only four colors show up because it has only four segments, but it, it's actually a five coloring, so all the equations will hold modulo five. So it's not a four coloring, but it's actually a five color. And you can do the same trick for all the others. So let me just try, this is very dangerous because I have to prepare, but let me just try to get five colors for you. So let's say we label the red strand zero, okay? And let's say we label the black strand one. So around this crossing, we need the, now the equation that uh, zero is congruent one plus blue. So blue is determined to be four because P is five. Remember, um, P is five. So one plus four is congruent zero, so it's divisible by five. So it's congruent zero, 
modulo p. And let's see, we can go on now. So here, this goes all the way down here. So we need to have 2 times 4, because it goes over, should be congruent a 1 plus question mark. So 2 times 4 is 8. That's 3 mod 5. So green is actually 2. And now we have all colors. So let's check. So here, there should be the equality 2 times 2 is equal to uh, 0. Red is 0 plus 4, which, of course, is true. So that's the equality here around this crossing. Um, here around this crossing is this one. Around this crossing, I haven't written it down, but it's 2 times 0. And that's the overgrowing one. It's equal to 4 plus 1. So we have one more to go. This one here, let me see, is 2 times 1 is congruent to uh, 0 plus 2. So all of them actually check out. This checks, this checks, this checks, this checks, which constructs explicitly. Uh, so that's the color code now. So I have four colors, and they correspond to numbers, uh, but the remainders on, upon division by 5. And instead of doing that by hand, I was lucky here because I already checked the determinant, so I know that this has to work out. Right? So instead of just doing it by hand, I compute the determinant. And I actually uh, know that this has to, has to work out. OK, let me summarize what we have seen. So at the beginning of the lecture, there was just essentially just one logic variant. Um, our little friend, the three coloring, which doesn't work for, so here three colors work very well for the, for the trefoil, um, but it doesn't really work for the figure eight knot. And the reason why it doesn't work is that the remaining strand wants an extra color. Uh, in this picture, in, in this animation, the whatever, the white color. So the white color. And um, we kind of define a new set of knot invariants, infinitely many, one for each one for each natural number bigger than three, um, which is this p colorable. And for example, this one was five colorable. And that's not just it. So it's not just we have an infinite number of uh, invariants now, but also we have a very explicit criterion to check what the invariants are for those knots. For example, for this one here, only the five coloring is interesting, all the others are boring, because it's not determined, it's divisible by, it's, it's five. So um, for the trefoil, the knot determinant was three. So the only interesting coloring is the three coloring. And for other knots, I, for other small crossing knots, I recommend to really just um, to do it by hand. So we have an infinite number of uh, knot invariants. And that's why I would like to 